uh, Sister Riley again is our teacher, and um, she's going to tell us what our lesson is about on this evening. Uh, we praise God for those of you that are coming in on Facebook now. Hope that we're loud and clear. We have not done this in a while from home. So uh, we, we run into a few difficulties, but we're almost there. Uh, are you ready? Just about. All right, give us just a few more minutes. Well, she's trying to get everything set up. Good, more, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We are excited about the possibilities we know that many of you are here on tonight and we're just excited and elated that you have come to share with us in this bible study in our youth bible study our children have been um studying uh, a series that actually was a it was actually a ypww series that my mother-in-law shared with me uh over a year ago and i thought that it was excellent so what I did was I got it and decided we were going to teach it to our youth. So uh, I'm pulling it up while I'm talking about it because, you know, with our youth, we have to have something that they are going to um, be able to see as well. So we want you to um, bear with us as we pull together all the technologies. It's been a minute since we've had to do this. You know, we were fluent with it when we were in um in the pandemic and immediately after the pandemic but bringing it all together is a is quite uh um challenging uh to say the least after you have not done it for so long so just bear with me as i pull up a <laughs> And I forgot that this computer does not have an H. <laughs> Lord have mercy. So it's not coming up. No, it's not. Okay, so everybody is coming in. So um, what I need you to do. Mm. Hold on just a minute. If everybody would just give me a minute. I'm a little lost right now and I have a presentation but it's kind of hard for me to pull up right now so if you would just give me a minute to pull it up I cannot spell this that's my problem right now trying to spell Jehovah without an H because this computer does not have an H And I'm trying to find a word that has an H in it, which I cannot do right now. Give us one minute, please. Highway. You see an H anywhere? Where? You see it? Yes. I don't see my. Oh, there it is. All right. It looks like we're getting here. We have so many technological challenges right now. Where is Zoom? All right. <laughs> All right, look like that's the right one. I forget the numbers. Let me 
this is shameful right now. But we have to do what we have to do. If you just give us one minute, we will be with you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, we were talking about the sexual revolution and how it has impacted America, how it has impacted our young people and how it has impacted our world. So it's very important, uh, specifically tonight, we're going to talk about, um, specifically tonight, we're going to talk about uh, the sexual, the spiritual impact of sex or the spiritual ramifications of sex. And so the spiritual component of sex, I guess I should be saying. So I have uh, prepared a PowerPoint, and that's what we're having trouble with right now. But I think that we're going to be there. In just a minute. All right, this is what I'm going to have to do right here. So the slide that I had, I'm not going to be able to do that one. All right, so I think you all will be able to see it right here so that we will not waste any more time. I'm just going to share from right where I am so that we will not waste any more time. I got it. I think everybody is here. Okay. Um, yes, Carmen, I tried to pull out Brittany's laptop, but the problem is that um, the problem is that there are so many pro there are so many issues with that. I have to explain that to you later. All right. All right, so I'm having Zoom issues. This, boy, this is really sad. All right, here it is. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And you all can let me know once you get it. So you all should be seeing my screen right about now. Someone let me know if you're sharing my screen, if you can see my screen. All right. Now, so this is what we're going to deal with tonight. I'm sorry I'm not able to pull up the PowerPoint, but at any rate, we have to make do with what we have. All right. So um, to our young people, I know you have invited some guests with us on tonight, and I'm going to give your guests a chance to... Um, a chance to sign in and say that they are your guests so you can get credit for your guests on tonight. Uh, okay, so let's dive right into our lesson. Sex, a spiritual act that is governed by spiritual laws. A spiritual act that is governed by spiritual laws. I do want you to be able to see the pastor as well. So when we, we are both talking, you will be able to see both of us. All right. People are still coming in and we're excited about those of you who are coming in. Sorry for the late start, but we had some technological issues. But here we are now. So our memory verse is, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. And we know that it's definitely one of the things, uh, uh, things that Paul was saying to the church at Thessalonica. And so notice what he says here. He says, I pray that, that, that God, I pray that God will sanctify, he said, first of all, and the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly, which means completely. And I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we looked at, um, some of our young people, we got started on it last week. We looked at the fact that we are, we have three parts. We are tripartite uh, being, which means we have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. And what we see here is that Paul is praying that our spirit be preserved blameless, our soul be preserved blameless, and our body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So understanding that we are, and we are, there are three parts to us. You know, we put so much emphasis on our body. We want our hair to look good. We want our clothes to look good. And so we talked about how we put so much emphasis on our body, 
but our soul and spirit many times are ravished because we do not feed our soul and our spirit. And also we looked at the fact that because we are a, a tripartite or we have three, spirit, soul, and body, we looked at just as man is three-dimensional, sex is three-dimensional. Sex does not only affect our bodies, but it also affects our soul and it, and it affects our spirit. So we want you, don't, don't go anywhere. We want you to be right here so that when we get a chance to discuss each and every intimate, uh, each and every uh, element that you will be right here. All right. Our introduction. There is more to you than meets the eye. When God created you, he created you with a body, soul, and spirit. Too often, we become preoccupied with our physical needs and forget about the needs of the spirit man. While meditating on 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, I began to understand that sexual intercourse was a three-dimensional act. What does that mean? It means that when you engage your body in the sex act, you also engage your soul and your spirit in that act as well. Sex involves the spirit, soul, and body. Sex is three-dimensional. So what we're, what we're coming to find out here is, and I don't know, Pastor, whenever you want to uh, chime in, just let me know. But whenever we engage in the, in the physical act, I tell my young people this. Every command that God gave us, he gave us for a reason. He gave it to us for our protection. He gave every command to us so that we could live the best possible life while here on earth. And so those laws that God has given us that govern our, yes, even our sex life, they are also given to us to protect us. They are given to us so that we can live the best possible life while here on earth. Now, um, last week we talked about, or uh, the, the lesson before this, we talked about um, the how sex affects the body. We talked about uh, sexual diseases. We talked about sexually transmitted infections. We talked about all of those things. So yes, we talked about how it affects the body, but today we're coming to let you know not only does it affect your body, but sex affects your spirit and it affects your souls. Many of us have heard about soul ties and how it seems that our bodies are connected with the person that we um, engage in sexual acts with. That's why God commanded us to save sex for marriage. Because this is something that he, con he created that married people enjoy. And that they can be connected in ways that they are, no, that they are connected with no other human being. The Bible talks about the two becoming one flesh. And so that's what he, he intended for. He had only intended that sex be um, saved for marriage, for that uh, it should be between uh, husband and wife. Because, and I want to say this slow, because we have so misused sex, because we have so misused sex, we are actually in a sexual crisis. We're in a sexual crisis because marriage has been taken out of the uh, out of the confines of holy matrimony. We're in a sexual crisis. Our children don't know whether they're male or female. Men and women don't know whether they want to be male or female. Now they're even saying um, they taught me when I, I teach English, they taught me that you only use it when you're talking about something that has no sexual identity like your table, your a box or whatever. Then I would refer to that as it. But nowadays, our people don't want to be referred to as he or she. We want to be referred to as they or we want it to be referred to as it. And it, it's a part of the sexual crisis that we are seeing here in America. There's this sexual crisis, not to mention other crises that we are seeing. We're seeing uh, sexual diseases on an um, all-time high. We are seeing sexual assaults at an all-time high. We are seeing insects, incest. All of that is the result of the fact that we have 
uh, taking sex out of the confines of, of matrimony, which is how God intended it for, from the beginning. All right. Look like pastor wants well, to no, go right ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And those of you who are also here, um, if you want to chime in, uh, this is definitely interactive. I do not want to do all of the, the talking. All right. The discussion. Let's go right into the discussion. The Bible teaches us that sex is more than a physical act. Act. Sex is a spiritual act that is governed by spiritual laws. When we violate the spiritual laws that govern human sexuality, we bring spiritual penalties or curses upon ourselves. I want to read that again. When we violate the spiritual laws that govern human sexuality, we bring spiritual penalties or curses upon ourselves. Understanding the nature of human sexuality is important because we will never solve this present sexual sexuality crisis we are facing with natural solutions alone. Listen, I don't care how much you take your child to the doctor, to the psychiatrist, to the therapist, you, the if your child is in sexual crisis, if your child has been violated, if your child has been dibbling and dabbling in something that God has um, created for marriage and now they are, quote unquote, out of control. Listen, there is no natural solution for that. The only solution for that has to be spiritual. Your child needs to be brought to God for um, for deliverance. And so that's what that's that's what we uh, need to understand here. Let me let somebody in here. All right. So uh, I think that also something that we need to talk about also is this. It says those things we said that the present sexual crisis we are facing with natural solutions. We're looking for natural answers to spiritual problems. When it comes to sexuality, we must also deal with the spiritual realities involved or we will never solve these problems. Yes, your child may, or, or I say child, but this is not just for children. There may be adults who are having a sexual crisis who are saying, I'm, I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, these people now say that my child wanted to be a uh, uh, a girl from the time they were born. And I personally don't believe that. I think that our children from the time they are born, we have to mold them. We have to show them what is right. We have to tell them, no, it's wrong for you to take someone else's toy. So if I'm teaching my children what is right and what is wrong when it comes to those types of things, why wouldn't I teach my child, no, girls, you you should not do this. Boys, you should not do that. There are some things that are more gender related. And so just as I tell my, my young, I, if uh, you have a young boy who wants to dress up in a dress, you don't think that's cute and let him dress up in a dress. You correct that child. You correct him just like you would correct him in any other thing. If there's a girl who wants to do some things that are that are not quite right. But now I'm going to tell you something. If they've gotten to a certain age and they're acting out in a certain way, my, my, uh, my advice to you would be this. To be sure you are watching who you leave your children with and who you leave your children around. It is my personal belief. That many people who are in sexual crisis from the time they are young, they have been sexually violated. Something has happened to them that has skewed, that has messed up, that has confused their sexual identity, that has confused their sexual uh, inclinations. And so we have to be so careful. Mothers, you cannot leave your children with anybody just because they're his, old, his older cousin. Just because that's his older uh, 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 uncle or somebody, you can't just leave your children with anybody. Because we have come to understand that many times we have left our children with someone and they have been taken advantage of. They have been sexually violated. Did you want to say something? Well, I don't know when you were going to get into... Uh to talk about the spirit of man or the... Let me say the spirit, spirit man. 
since our subject is a spiritual act that is governed by spiritual laws, uh, you need to understand, and we'll go back to something that Sister Riley said earlier, that we are composed of three parts. The body, that's what you see. You, you see the body. But on the inside of the body, there is a spirit man that's composed of the, the other two, and that would be the soul and the spirit. Now, I teach this. I do believe that the soul and spirit of, of a man looks identical to your physical body, but it is of a spirit substance. And that spirit man uh, has to reside in a body so that uh, you can operate in a physical world. But it is the spirit man. Look at this. The spirit man that, that's composed of the soul and the spirit. That's the real you. Your eyes are nothing but a window for the real person to uh, be able to see in the physical world. Your mouth is a, a, a means or a door, you might want to say, in order for you to be able to communicate, um, to be able to communicate uh, in this physical world. Now, let's go back to the spirit, man. The, the soul of man, and I'm, I want to do this very quickly, and I, I don't want to confuse, and we have our young people who are here uh, on this uh uh, Bible uh, study tonight, and actually, it is the youth Bible study. The adults are joining in with them. But, but when you talk about the soul, the soul is made up of your emotions. That's one part of the soul. Also, within your soul is your intellect, so your mind, so how you think. That's a part of the soul. And then the last part would be your volition. It would be your will. So it's where you make decisions all right that's the soul and then the spirit of man uh it is how you actually connect connect with god part of your spirit man will be your um conscience and and god has put a conscience in in each and every one of us uh to help us to distinguish between right and wrong so when you talk about this subject, a spiritual act that is governed by spiritual laws, how does this phys physical act of sex, how does it affect us spiritually? What, you know, what, what, is the, what is the connection? But let, let me give you a biblical story. I don't know when you're going to talk about Dinah, what happened to Dinah. Go ahead. Where you're going to talk about Dinah in, in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, uh, we, we're quite familiar with Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. We so often talk about his 12 sons. The 12 sons became the leaders of the 12 tribes. But we know of at least one daughter. And the daughter's name was Dinah. When Jacob uh, went to a certain part of Canaan, uh, in, in an area that was known as Shechem, uh, the prince, he was a Hittite, the prince who, who would be the son, uh, the leader of that area, violated Jacob's daughter, Dinah. In other words, he raped her. After this awful act uh, took place, the Bible in the King James Version used the word defile. He went to his, he went to his father uh, because he just had to seem to have this girl out of this rape that he had committed. The Bible said, listen to this, listen to these words, and his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel. Now, now, he has violated this girl. And from that violation, his soul, the Bible said, has what? Has clave, or it has become attached to this girl. That's what we would call a soul tie. And he tells the father, I've got to have her. I want to marry her. Now, what is interesting that when his father goes to Dinah's father to arrange or to come up with some kind of arrangement for the two young people to get married, there's nothing in the scripture, Sister Ryder, that shows where Dinah objected to it. I, I really believe, now this is just my personal belief, that 
if Dinah had opposed to this, I believe Jacob probably would have said no from the beginning. But look like Jacob was going to go with, go through it at first. There's nothing there. And there are studies that indicate even when a, a, a woman has been raped, even though it is a very awful thing that has happened, that many times, uh, even though she has been violated, that there is still some kind of connection with the rapist, which sounds kind of odd. It sounds kind of weird. But there have been studies to show this. I do know this. I have observed couples uh, throughout the years. I'm talking about unmarried couples where the uh, the young man is uh, abusive to the young lady. There's been sexual contact. They have been together. He treated her so bad, called all kind of names, even abused her physically. Uh, but for some reason or another, She's drawn back to that same young man. She goes right back to him. You know why? Because there is that soul tie. That is because this act of a sexual union, as you said correctly at the beginning, it should be only between husband and wife because it is taking place. It brings a connection of the male and female together uh, uh, where it seems like even though he's treating her so bad, she yet cannot get him out. Let me put this out of her system. And she seems like she just yet is drawn to him, even though he's treating her bad. And, and, and sometimes even dealing with other girls, she feels like she still has to have him. You see that special attraction and, and, and that special connection was intended that it be only for husband and wife. That particular act is for the bonding in holy matrimony. But if you go outside of holy matrimony, if you go out outside of the marriage covenant, that type of attraction can be there and can be to your detriment. It can be there to your destruction. All right. So again, when we talked about the fact that God gave it to husband and wife, he gave it to husband and wife because of the fact he fully understood every implication of sex. He fully understood it. And so to take it outside of the confines of, of God's intended purpose is when uh, is the reason. Look, a lot of times people say, well, why did he do this or why did he do that? Well, he created certain things for certain reasons. It is man who uh, violates his original purpose for certain things and therefore have to um, have to um, have to pay the penalty for that. And we talked about those penalties a minute ago. All right. So I it's think, I, I want to say this to the Facebook audience. We were not able to connect Zoom with Facebook. I just hate that so bad because this graph that you have now is it, 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 it this way. Well, hopefully you can. It's 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 uh it's good information that I think that would be really good for you. I tell you what we'll do later on. We'll just upload it to our Facebook page. Okay. We will upload it to our Facebook page, and that way um, you will be able to see it. It'll be later, but you will be able to see it. All right? Let's go right on. All right. For example, the world has preached the doctrine of safe sex as the solution to the teen sexuality uh, crisis. The safe sex message consists of using condoms and birth control pills. This message has failed miserably. You got to be careful with this. I get it. This message has failed miserably because it only deals with the physical. You see, condoms may pre prevent a teen from contracting some sexually transmitted diseases. But they will not protect, protect a child from the spiritual disease or afflictions that, that may affect youth, that youth for a lifetime. I want to say that again. Condoms may prevent a teen from contracting some sexually transmitted diseases. But they will not protect a child from the spiritual diseases or afflictions that may affect youth for a lifetime. And you say, uh, what do you mean by that? Let me read this next sentence and then I'll go into it. Birth control pills may prevent conception in the natural, and that it is may, 
But what about that which is conceived in the spiritual womb of those who commit fornication? So we talked about the fact that, um, you know, a lot of times, sometimes parents will run out and they'll say, you know what? The first thing they want to do to protect their child is to put their child on birth control pills or to teach their child about condoms. And they think that when they do this, um, you know, they are doing everything they can because they don't want their children to uh, their child to have a baby. But what the parent does not realize is that there are some spiritual implications behind it that they cannot protect from. We talked about the fact that sex is uh, um, it's a it's three dimensional body, soul and spirit. So what we need to understand is this. Sex is emotional. A parent cannot protect the child from the emotions that were tied to that physical act. The fact that I have given myself to someone who now is at school and, and if I've gotten pregnant, he's saying it's not his baby. He's saying I've slept with more than one person or he's saying he no longer wants me. What does a parent do about that? Or from the fact that it floods the mind, it floods the mind, the memory of the act, the memory that's tied to it. Uh, and they tell me, Pastor, that one of the strongest, um, one of the strongest things that's tied to memory for women is smell. That's why many women are attracted by good smelling men. Their the cologne smells so good and that, that scent does not leave the mind for a while. Well, guess what? It's the same concept. It's that same concept, but worse when you have given yourself to someone. Because even smells, certain smells can bring that back to the individual. So to, to tell your child, listen, just get you some pills or just get you some condoms, that does not protect them. That It may or may not protect the body, but it does not protect the soul and it definitely does not protect the spirit. I don't know if, you, oh, I guess you can see this here now. All right. All right, let's go to the next one. Human sexuality is a divine gift. That means it comes from God that touches and affects every aspect of human personality, spirit, soul, and body. Human sexuality must be understood within the context of its spiritual foundation. Sex is a spiritual experience. Do y'all hear that? Sometimes we don't fully understand, but sex is a spiritual experience. All right. Let me see if I can show this grid. That's what I want to see right there. Spiritual experiences are governed by spiritual laws. As we study the spiritual laws that govern human sexuality, we will better understand God's purpose for sex. In the book, Sex and the Bible, a Bible perspective of human sexuality, we discuss several different biblical laws that govern our sexuality, which include the law of union, law of fornication, law of cleaving, the hymen principle, and the law of circumcision. All right, that's a book that you might want to take another look at. All right. An example of sp spiritual sexual origin is found in Genesis 17, 10 through 11. And that is our text for today. And it reads, This is my agreement that all of you must obey. This is the agreement between me and you and all your descendants. Every male must be circumcised. You will cut the skin to show that you follow the agreement ain't no this right here, between you and me. So what we find here is that God made a covenant with Abraham and he, his covenant was that every male must be circumcised. I think somebody needs to mute. Let me help you out with that. Every male must be circumcised. Let me mute everybody here. Yes. Okay. That every male must be circumcised. Do you want to give us a little bit more on that? No, please. All right. And I think they're gonna we're gonna discuss that a little bit more in the upcoming slides. Every male must be circumcised. And this was symbolic. It was an agreement that God had with Abraham that his descendants would also enter into this degree uh this agreement. And actually, 
be saved as a as a part of this relationship or this agreement. Now, Genesis 17 records the Abrahamic covenant or contract. A covenant is a binding agreement between two or more individuals. This covenant had four key elements. Number one, there was a name change. His name was changed from Abram to Abraham. Number two, land was given, land was to be given to Abraham's seed. Number three, this covenant was to be eternal from generation to generation. And then number four, a surgical procedure known as circumcision. All right. Circumcision is the removal of the foreskin of the male organ. Why did God cut Abraham? Why did God cut Abraham on that part of his body? Think about it. God could have chosen to cut Abraham anywhere on his body. Finger, ear, nose. God chose to cut Abraham on his penis or organ of reproduction to enter into a sacred and holy covenant with him. God never does anything just to be doing it. He always has a purpose, whether we understand it or not. There are several spiritual lessons that, can, that one can glean from God circumcising Abraham. Covenant with God begins at the level of your sexuality. Listen, let me tell you something. We always have to teach our children about the culture in which we live because we should not allow our culture to dictate how we live. I, the Bible should dictate how we live. And why did I say that? Because our culture says things like, oh, boys will be boys, which means that boys can do anything they want to because they're boys. Uh, our culture says things like, oh, young people are going to have sex. They are automatically going to have sex. That's what the, a, a teacher told me years ago. We were in a, con a conversation and um, we were talking about an abstinence program. And she declared that um, there is no sense in teaching these children abstinence because all of them have already had sex. And I'm, I, I, I do not believe that every young person has already had sex. I do not believe that every young person is just going to automatically have sex. And so she th thought that it was useless for us to teach young people about abstinence because they're going to do it anyway. So listen, she is a product of our culture. That's what our culture says. But we are not we are not bound by our culture. We do not follow the rules of our culture. We follow the rules of our God. All right? Can somebody help me with your mute? When your sexuality or sex drive is yielded to God, you are yielded wholly to God. Let me help you out. Somebody has uh, lost their mute again. All right, let me go back. When your sexuality, your sex drive is yielded to God, you are yielded wholly to God. Listen, you do not have, have to let your sex drive run, run wild. Will young people be tempted sometimes? Absolutely. But just as sure as I could tell my young child, don't go out, out into a street when you see a car coming. I can teach my young person that they should not be engaged in premarital sex or sex outside of marriage. Because just like I understand the physical ramifications of my child going out into a street when a car is coming, I understand the physical, the how sex affects the body, how it affects the soul, and how it affects the spirit. There is a spiritual component. And there will be spiritual consequences that come along with a child having sex outside of marriage. Circumcision is symbolic of the removal of sin. Circumcision is symbolic of the removal of that which will never hinder spiritual intercourse with God. In circumcision, God was asserting his right to rule over man's sex life. In circumcision, God was asserting his right to rule over man's sex life. When we totally submit ourselves to God, then God rules over our sex life. 
we just not, we don't we're just not out there. You know, America has told us that we are free. You know, with the women's resolution. As a matter of fact, with the sexual revolution, I wish we had time to see that um, video to talk about how when the sexual revolution came about, that with birth, the entrance of birth control and the entrance of uh, uh, condoms and the entrance of all kinds of other um, sexually, um, sexual, what they call protection, then women felt like, well, my sexuality, I'm free to do whatever I want to. And I'm not just women, but men as well. So that whereas America once had a biblical view of sex, when the sexual revolution came around, we now had a totally different um, view of sex. Sex was something that we, you know, we're now told that I, we, this is my body. You know, that's all we talk about. Now, this is my body. I can do what I want to with my body. That's all they cry when we, when we talk against um, abortion, when we talk against things like that. That's the first thing, my body, my, my choice. That's their, their mantra, my body, my choice. But that, that is a, your body, your choice that you're going to have to answer God for if you continue in uh, in sin, regardless of whether that's sex outside of marriage or when you have to result in doing something as, as um, far as abortion. Same thing. We have to answer for that. All right. Anything, Pastor? You got no, something so far? Right All right. To the conclusion. God's purpose and plan for your life are intimately connected with your sexuality, your identity, who you are, purpose, why you are. And destiny all are all connected to your sexuality. Satan knows that if he can if he can trap you in sexual sin, he can easily destroy God's plan for your life. If the devil can pervert God's plan for your sexuality, your life's purpose is never fully experienced, and your life's destiny will never be fully attained. If the devil can pervert God's plan for you sexually, if he can get you to believe. What our culture teaches us, what America teaches us, what our friends say to us when we're at school. If he can get you to, if he can get you to believe that, then your life's purpose is never fully experienced and your life's destiny will never fully be attained. On the other hand, when you walk in sexual purity, your purpose may be fully experienced and you are positioned to fulfill your destiny. Abram willingly submitted to hit this painful um, procedure because he wanted himself and his offspring to be identified as belonging to God. In submitting to circumcision, Abraham was symbolically submitting his total being to God and his future offspring to God. Pastor, um, we talked a little bit earlier and I want you to shed some life on um, when we talked about sex being spiritual we looked at the scripture, and I'm going to go back to that scripture. All right, I'm going to go. Yes, Sister Jones, it's really deep. I want to go back to that scripture that I had. Um, yes, here it is right here. Maybe you can take us through these scriptures, Pastor. All right. The, the scripture that's found in 1 Corinthians 6 and 15, you had Facebook, man. Okay. Don't you know that your bodies are part of the body of Christ? Is it right for me to join part of the body of Christ? Or let, let me read that again. Is it right for me to join part of the body of Christ to a prostitute? No, it isn't. Don't you know that a man who does that becomes part of a body? The scriptures say the two of them would be like one person. But anyone who is joined to the Lord... Is one in spirit with him. Don't be immoral in matters of sex. Uh, that is a sin against your own body in a way that no other sin is. You surely know that your body is a temple where the Holy Spirit lives. The Spirit is in you and is a gift from God. You are no longer your own. And in the last verse, I'll tell us in verse 20. And of course, this, this is a different version, King James Version. I think you probably, many of you would know this. God paid a great price for you. So use your body to honor God. Well, it, it goes back really to these scriptures, to some of the things that I said earlier uh, on tonight. Uh, 
Paul was letting us know in this passage of scripture as well as some other scriptures that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It is the place where uh, you he wants to abide and wants to dwell within. Now, when you violate God's law, then your body becomes unclean and the Spirit of God cannot dwell there as he so desired. And to have the Spirit of God there on the inside brings joy, it brings peace, it brings love. But now, uh, uh, when we go back to that very first verse, and, and I guess I really need, because I didn't get a chance to really study this lesson uh, as I should have. Uh, but when a man and woman comes together, the Bible lets you let us know that uh, the two are no longer twain, but they become one flesh. You come together as one husband and wife. This is the way God so designed it. But if you give yourself to another person, and in this scripture here, uh, Paul was saying, he asked the question. He said, is it right for me to join part of the body of Christ to a prostitute? And now says, no, it isn't. In other words, if I'm a believer and I'm saved and it's the place where the Spirit of God is supposed to dwell within me and I go out and I commit a sexual sin, is it right to join or to hook up with that person that, that the script here referred to as a prostitute that King James Version probably said Harlan, possibly. Uh, no, it is not because when you do this, when you join in the sexual union, as I stated earlier, uh, just as husband and wife will become one of the sexual uh, activities for husband and wife, the same thing happens when you are with someone that is not your spouse. You have joined to that person. There is a soul tie. There is an intermingling of the two. And let me go a little bit further. I did say this earlier. You know, when you talk about the soul tie, and I, I told you the soul was a place of your emotions. Uh, you, you, let's stick with that part, the place of your emotions. Well, when you join with a person, uh, you actually take, really take a part of their soul within you. Have you all ever noticed that sometimes married couples, and, and they've been together for a while, that they seem to think alike? act alike in some cases. Sometimes they can be talking and and before one can finish the sentence, the other one finishes the sentence for them. That's because they know each other. They've been together. They have become one flesh. All right? And that's what God has intended. But then if you do this outside of the marriage covenant, look at what you're dealing with. You 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 you're connected to a person uh, emotionally the soul tie to a person that is not rightfully yours and this is when uh, this is why in many cases when there's a breakup of a couple who's not married but they have been together sexually that uh, people talk about killing themselves they go out and they commit suicide they can't take it because you see their soul is broken because there's a soul tie and now the, the connection is broken. And they know that this person has moved on to another person. And and so they talk about killing them. Or you, you take where a, a young man says, because it's not just the, 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 the woman that becomes emotional. Many times it's the young man as well. The young man comes out and says, well, if I can't help it, nobody will. Absolutely. And then what does he do? He goes and he shoots and kills. Or sometimes he kills himself and so forth. Uh Nine times out of ten, well, I probably greater than nine times out of ten. That's ninety percent. I would probably say ninety-nine percent or higher. Then, when you have incidents of violence in that way, uh, where suicide is committed, or where the person kills the other, because it's not always the the man that kills the woman. Sometimes the woman who kills the man that has happened too, or there's some other type of violent act that has taken place. Uh, in most cases, if you could do the research and and the truth is uncovered, you find out that they've been sexually involved. You see, when a couple has 
been together and they have not been sexually involved. I'm not going to say that that there are no harsh feelings or you don't feel bad, but it, it is much easier for that breakup to take place. I mean, it's very much, it, it's, it's, it's very easy to, or easier to put it that way. And you can move on to, to maybe dating another person. But once you cross that line, mm -hmm. then there's a soul tie. And think about this. And I'm going to get back to this right. Think about these people who who uh, have gone from person to person, bedroom to bedroom, what they call casual sex, uh, friends with benefits, all this kind of food just today, all of that stuff. Those soul ties with multiple people. One writer said that each one of those persons has a part of your soul. The soul is broken, it, it, almost like in pieces. It, can I say this? And this is for our children uh, as well as adults, because I, I told Sarah, the adults need this lesson too. Mm -hmm. That many times when, when, when persons have been uh, with multiple partners, and then they, they get into their late 20s, their 30s, and decide they want to settle down and get married, or oh, now I have found the person I want to spend the rest of my life. Once they have gotten married, many times they have all kind of issues in their marriage. Because remember, we talked about this thing being spiritual, which includes the soul, your emotions, your thoughts. A lot of that stuff from the past will pop up in your mind and will give you problems in terms of related to your spouse. Because you can't get these other people right. out of your soul. The mind is a part of your soul. And so uh, many couples today, married couples today that are having many marital problems, and I, I didn't say everybody, but many of them have many marital problems right now, is because of what they did prior to that marriage. So when the Bible tells you to flee fornication, uh, God knew exactly what he meant. It is for your good. Absolutely. You know, I think about while you were talking, Pastor Iyer, um, you know, when back in the day when um, parents, you know, parents would notice their children when their children started acting differently. Mm -hmm. And while they didn't understand the spiritual uh, ramifications of what their children had done, they knew their children had done something. Right. And so they would put it this way. Oh, you smelling yourself, ain't you? Right. They knew that you had gone out and done something that you had no business because you were acting differently. Sometimes that, that girl was acting like that boy. Right. You know, had right. that rebellious spirit. Right. Had those, you know, and, and what, what, what some people believe is called transference of spirits. Right. Right. Because when you join with somebody and you join with these, you know, it seems like this nice little girl, she's gotten with this guy who's, you know, wild. just, just wild. And, wow. and now wow. she, she's different. And it's because those spirits that were dwelling in him have transferred. Yeah. And it's through that sexual act. So listen, I see some of you are talking about how deep it is. It's deeper than you really think. Every commandment, I can't say this enough, that God gave us. He gave it to us for a reason. He gave it to us for our protection. He commanded us to do. All right, this we this is good. We we could go on at six o'clock, and I have promised our young people that um, their guests, if your guests will look in the chat, if your guests will look in the chat, they can complete a form to let me know that they are here. You can also every young person. I want you to go to the chat and complete that form to show that you are here. But I also want your guests to complete the form so that your guests will be able to tell me that. They are here because you invited them. And that way, um, thank you. Uh, you're welcome, uh, Azarian. That way you will get your credit. Listen, every time you bring a guest to Lily of the Valley members this year, we are, we are bringing in the harvest. We are, the Bible said that the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. We are declaring that we will be laborers in the vineyard. Every time you bring a guest, we need you to be sure that you are, uh, let us know so that we can calculate the number of guests you bring through the door this year. And today counts also. All right. God bless you. Hold on for you. For you, uh, this mess, I guess you could say this mess. Uh, again, uh, we, we thank you for being here. I'm just so sorry that we had all those technical issues. We hadn't done this from home.
home in a while, so we had to switch computers and a lot of things happened um, that were beyond our control, but, but, but hopefully we've done something uh, that will be a benefit to you. We thought it was best not to go out to the church that is Sunday. Uh, the weather is going to slowly improve tomorrow, so we shouldn't have any ice um, on this weekend. We look forward to seeing everybody in the house of the Lord on Sunday morning uh, for our Sunday school and worship time. Sunday is the third Sunday, so it's you Sunday. I think Sister Riley will get with you to tell the young people how we're going to go about this you Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking to have a, a great time in the Lord. We had a oh, we had a wonderful, wonderful time this past Sunday, and I believe God is going to meet us again this coming Sunday. Don't forget, Lily Valley. I want you to go with me to House of Prayer on Sunday evening. The revival that was scheduled for. Last Sunday, it was moved to this coming Sunday. Revival will begin at 5 o'clock, so go with me. Um, I'll be there for three nights at House of Prayer for a revival uh, right here in Greenville. We look for a great time in the Lord, so let's come together on Sunday and Sunday evening. You're trying to show me something, or you just put that there no, so they can see. Yes. All right. May the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. Until the next time, we're looking forward to seeing you on this coming Sunday morning. God bless you. You be blessed in the name of the Lord. Okay, someone asked about me being able to put the link on Facebook. I was trying to find a way that I could possibly do that. And um, so what I will do is this. Um, either you can share that link with the people who were on Facebook or I can go back and, and edit this. I'll go back and edit it after um, we have finished it. All right, God bless you. We love you with the love of God. Thank you for all of you who, who have come.